Hello, everyone. And welcome to the talk titled uh, Bringing Spiffy to Linkerd for Mesh Expansion. And in this talk, we are going to take a look at how Linkerd, the service mesh, augmented its identity system in order to allow for uh, meshing external workloads or actually making workloads that are not part of Kubernetes part of the mesh. Uh, my name is Zahari Dichev, and I'm a software engineer at Buoyant, uh, the creators of Linkerd. And if you ever want to connect or chat, you can always reach me on any of these channels. I'm always happy to chat. So in this talk, we are going to, uh, first of all, take a look at, make the case for mesh expansion. So what is it, and why might organizations actually need that functionality? And then we are going to look at why workload identity matters both within and outside of the cluster, and what are the guarantees that you get with the encryption and identity that's implemented in modern service meshes. We're going to take a look at how that specifically works in Linkerd, so with MTLS, and we are going to discuss some of the challenges that appear once you once you cross the boundary and you end up on a bare metal machine that's not part of Kubernetes. And then we are going to look at how we use Spire and Spiffy and leverage this technology in order to solve these problems. And hopefully at the end we can have some time for a Q&A if you want to ask questions about any of that. So first of all, let's actually um, take a look at what is mesh expansion and wh why organizations might need that. So really, if I have to put it succinctly, um, mesh expansion is the process of actually uh, making non-Kubernetes workloads part of the service mesh. And the main motivation for doing that is to enable hybrid cloud infrastructure scenarios where you have part of your infrastructure on, let's say, bare metal machines or on-prem boxes, uh, but you want to be able to connect uh, this infrastructure to Kubernetes and have the workloads in Kubernetes communicate with it as if this infrastructure was native Kubernetes workloads. And this is really for the reason to kind of gain this, uh, to, to, to be able to be generic over the specifics of, inf of your infrastructure. So whether this is whether this workload is hosted on a local data center or on the cloud, like that shouldn't really matter. You should still be able to get all the nice things that you get when you're serv using a service mesh, namely um, security guarantees, reliability features such as uh, circuit breaking, load balancing, uh, traffic policy, and all of that. So what are some of the specific scenarios that kind of motivates the you know, using uh, a hybrid cloud infrastructure and thereby mesh expansion? Well, there are a few distinct cases. I'm sure there are more, but this is what we're going to look at. Uh, so first of all, there is the case for the integration of edge devices. So nowadays, there are a lot of organizations that manage fleets of devices that just cannot run on Kubernetes. So, you know, they're like out in the field sensors that run on specialized hardware that, you know, you just can't run in Kubernetes. Um, another reason is um, cost optimization and the use of specialized hardware. So, you know, again, there are organizations that need to use hardware that's either not available from cloud vendors or it is kind of prohibitively expensive to obtain. And then there is the case for incremental infrastructure modernization where organizations are trying to shift to the cloud gradually and they want to migrate just part of their stack to Kubernetes. So let's actually look at like how each one of these might look like from an architecture perspective. So let's say you're working for an organization that uh, has a KNS cluster and there is uh, a bunch of services there that their purpose is to communicate with uh, edge devices, and you have your team working uh, with like a dashboard that uses some of these services in order to um, observe these devices. So, you know, look at 
health, health data that's been sent by the devices uh, and all sorts of um, monitoring data around this. And then on the other end, you have devices such as like watches that might be using some services in your cluster. You have mobile phones that are also need secure and reliable connection to the cluster. And you might even have software that actually runs on cars that also needs to talk to the cluster. So naturally, like these things cannot um, live on the cluster, but you still want to expose the cluster to them and vice versa. Then you also might be in a position where you are in need of specialized hardware. And there are organizations that, namely financial institution organizations that use data from providers such as Bloomberg and Reuters and the likes, and they're in the business of gathering large volumes of financial data, so say, prices that, for example, might land in your Kubernetes cluster where they are per persisted in a database, and you have some analytic services that is supposed to actually work with that data, and you have a bunch of clients in your organization that are using the service to compute some statistical models on that data. And we're talking about stuff like Monte Carlo simulations or heavy AI workloads. And a lot of these workloads are fitted particularly well for uh, running on specialized hardware. So either specialized GPU chips or as they call them, AI chips. And you could be in a position where you want to host some of that hardware in your local on-prem infrastructure and not in a public cloud because it's either very expensive in the cloud or they just don't have this, these, these uh, pieces of hardware there. Or you want to tweak something specifically uh, um, and be able to, to kind of manage it yourself. And, you know, but you still want this analytic service, for example, like in this case, to be able to talk to <clears throat> this box, this hardware box, and be able to get the advantage of the fact that you're using a service mesh in Kubernetes. Also, there is the case for cloud migration. So, you know, there's a number of organizations that um, still are running quite legacy software on-prem. So things like Cobol services, mainframe APIs, and, and I know we, most of us here probably live in this world where we are all running stuff on someone else's computer in the cloud and, 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 and it's all virtualized, but, but this other world exists where there's organizations that are legacy in nature and in their tech stack, and they ideally want to move uh, to the cloud using Kubernetes cluster. And oftentimes what, <clears throat> what they do is they, they can't just run this migration from day zero to one because it's just a big bang, it's very risky. So they would kind of try and shift some of these services onto the cluster, route their traffic through an API gateway or something, and just set up the grounds for this more modern infrastructure, and then gradually uh, migrate their infrastructure to Kubernetes, but uh, while they are doing that, they need a connection to their legacy infrastructure in order to support operations. And this way, <clears throat> they could be very strategic about uh, when they are doing this migration, how they are doing it, at what pace. And this gives them optionality, which is important. So with all of these things being said, there is one theme that is kind of recurringly appears uh, and this is the need for workload identity and security and encryption on this traffic that is flying outside of your Kubernetes cluster. And the way modern service meshes implement uh, this is through, uh, mostly through TLS, right? So, um, and this is nice because it gives you a certain number of properties that, you know, if you don't, have them, you can get yourself into quite hairy situations. So the first thing that you get because of workload identity and encryption with a service mesh is authenticity. And this really is the idea that uh, the parties on each side of uh, the connection can prove that they are who they say they are. <clears throat> and this is important because if you actually don't have that, what could end up happening is that you could have an attacker. So imagine like this service in a Kubernetes cluster, 
tries to talk to some smartwatch. Well, if you don't have a principled way of identifying this particular piece of hardware, then you're exposed to attacks where another, another actor could pretend to be that, that piece of hardware. You also get confidentiality, which really is um, the guarantee that no one could actually just read the data that you're sending. And of course, if you don't have that, you end up again in a situation where somebody could listen in on your data. And for some <clears throat> particular industries, this is absolutely prohibitive. So industries like healthcare and defense that are heavily re regulated, like they can't allow themselves to be in this situation. You also get integrity, which means that because you get the cryptographic integrity that um, helps you verify the fact that the same data that is received is the data that was sent. And of course, if you actually don't have that, you could end up with man in the middle attacks that allow a third party to kind of intercept and tamper with your data, which as you probably might imagine can lead to quite a lot of bad outcomes. So on top of that, when you have MTLS, you also get authorization, which means that you can attribute granular access policies to certain clients. So for example, you can, if you know and can identify this particular instance of a piece of hardware, you can configure the system to only allow traffic to one service originating from this, from this uh, peer and <clears throat> ban traffic to another service. So really, let's actually talk about how this is currently implemented in Linkerd. So how do we actually achieve identity in Linkerd and how does it work with um, Kubernetes specifically? So identity in Linkerd is effectively MTLS, so mutual TLS for both client and server identities. Linkerd uses uh, short-lived X509 TLS certificates that each proxy is issued and that are rotated periodically. I think like every 24 hours or so. And this document essentially, the certificate, is used obviously for both like proving the identity of the workload to its peer and also um, encryption of the data. So the identity attestation framework that Linkerd uses is based on service account tokens. <clears throat> so when I say identity attestation, I mean that it is as the service account token is the principled way of a workload proving its identity and kind of ensuring that it deserves to be given a certificate. And because both client and servers are you know, authenticated because this is a MTLS connection, then you can apply traffic policies, obviously, on both ends. So how does that work in practice at the moment in Kubernetes? Well, whenever a pod starts up, you actually end up with a service account for this pod that uh, is uh, either the default one or a specified one that you've configured. Now, the service account a service account token is issued based on the service account and it's mounted onto the file system of the pod. So when the pod, uh, when the proxy fires up initially, one of the first thing it does is that, well obviously it needs a TLS certificate in order to talk to other peers. So what it's going to do is that it's going to generate a private key that never leaves this pod, uh, that it's going to use for the certificate and it's going to generate a certificate signing request, essentially saying, okay, I, uh, to, uh, to the upstream authority that it needs a particular certificate with a particular identity. And this identity is based on the service account. So it's the name of the service account dot uh, namespace dot service dot cluster domain. So now what it's going to do is that it's going to package both the CSR, so the certificate signing request, and the token, and it's going to send them to the 
control plane to the identity service that's the upstream CA. Now, this identity service needs to ensure that uh, this workload actually is the workload that it says it is, because anyone can send a certificate signing request to it with some demands. In order to do that, it checks the service account token that's part of the request with the Kubernetes API. And essentially, it's looking for the answer of, well, does this service account token belong to this service account that I'm being asked to issue an identity for? And if that is the case, and that's greenlit, it replies back with an X509 certificate that contains the identity in a, in a DNS-like form and the uh, subject alternative name, the DNS subject alternative name metadata of the certificate. This certificate is used as follows uh, when a proxy initiates connection to another proxy. First of all, the server presents its certificate. Um, the client verifies that certificate in order to ensure that, indeed, the peer that it's talking to is the peer that it intended to talk to. So when that's, when that's done, um, it's the opposite way around. The client presents the TLS certificate. So that's like normal MTLS handshake. The client presents its certificate, and the server verifies it with the trust routes cryptographic, cryptographically, and it parses it. And when it parses it, it extracts the identity of the client. So now it knows which particular client is talking to it. And it can consult the control plane for traffic policies and essentially determine whether this particular traffic should be allowed. So, you know, there could be a policy that allows traffic only on port 8080 from this set of TLS identities on this particular HTTP path. So it's like this kind of, this kind of policies are also up kind of layer seven aware. So they are like protocol aware policies. So this is all great in terms of security, right? We get we get uh, identity, we can attribute policy to it, we get encryption, and it has been working for a while quite nicely in Kubernetes. Now, what happens about workloads that are living outside of Kubernetes though? Now, the moment you cross that bridge, you end up with a couple of problems. So first of all, um, there is no real way for an external bare metal VM to attest its identity to the control plane because you know, it doesn't possess a service account token, which is the main mechanism for attesting an identity and getting a certificate. And you know, that makes it kind of hard to obtain a certificate, which makes everything else hard because you kind of need TLS to, to, to actually be part of the mesh and get all the benefits. So what are some of the potential solutions to that problem? Well, for starters, um, you could use some mechanism for manually provisioning TLS certificates to these boxes, which is not ideal because, you know, the whole, like, part of the reason, part of the appeal for using a service mesh is that you get certificate management for free. Like you don't really need to care about rotating these certificates, how long they're gonna last, what's the chain, where is the CA, you kind of get it for free. Now, you, you, and you wanna keep that because this is error prone stuff, especially at scale. You can manually distribute service account tokens, so you, know, you could actually use the Kubernetes API in order to get yourself a service account token for a particular service account and just put it on the box that you want, want to mesh. Uh, but then you end up in a situation where, how do you actually do that securely? Like, what, you need to come up with a process that, in order to do that securely. And that's hard and error prone, especially, again, at scale, because it's just one machine. Yeah, you can use a flash drive, right? But, you know, if it's thousands or hundreds of machines, that's, that's getting harder and harder. And, and it's also, associated with a lot of management costs around like keeping track of rotating and the expiration of these tokens. You can use as other mechanisms such as client grants, access tokens, and JWTs and whatnot, uh, but this is just like 
a different piece of technology with different attributes. Um, or you could use something that we've leveraged, which is Spiffy, which is a framework for uh, securely authenticating software systems across heterogeneous environments. And that's kind of a mouthful, but uh, really what this gives you is uh, uh, defines a standard way to prove and obtain workload identities, which really is in an essence a replacement for this attestation bit that we have in Kubernetes, but we are missing outside of Kubernetes. And Spire is the reference implementation of this standard um, that we, we, are, we are using in Linkerd now. And it has integration with major cloud providers and upstream CA. So it's very extensible. It's very customizable. Um, and it can serve identities both in JWT form or X509 certificate, which is what we actually care about. So some of the core concepts of this is the spiffy ID, which is a string to uniquely identify uh, a workload or a group of workloads. And this spiffy ID is similar to what, um, in, in purpose to what uh, we use in Kubernetes with the DNS-like identities. You've got an SVIT, which is essentially the document that you use in order to prove your identity. That's either an X509 certificate or a JWT token. And the SVIT, in this case, contains the spiffy ID. And you also have like the workload API, which runs locally on a node that your workloads can use in order to um, obtain identity. So some of the core components are a Spire server, which is responsible for managing and issuing identities based on regis registration entries. So you know, it, it uses node attestation to identify agents that connect to it, essentially uh, trying to determine the identity of the particular node that the agent is running on and the workload is running on. And based on registration entities, it could give the correct identity to the node, so uh, to the agent that connects. And this could be extended with uh, upstream plugins, so you could get it to talk to your upstream CAs, such as Vault and the likes. The Spire agent is what actually runs on the node and exposes the Spiffy a workload API to workloads that, uh, that, that run on this particular node, and it serves identity to them. Um, and it performs workload attestation. And this is really kind of proving, ensuring that the workload that's asking for an identity is indeed the workload that it says it is. So if, or rather, it gives it the identity that's prescribed to the workload. So how does that actually, how does this attestation work in practice if you don't have a service account to prove your, uh, to prove your identity? Or if you're not in the possession of a service account token. Well, um, so on the node level, essentially you could use selectors that kind of tie very well with your uh, infrastructure that you are running. So for example, if you are running on AWS, the agent itself can actually introspect the node that, that it's running on and determine whether this is a node that has a particular instance ID pattern or contains a particular set of AWS instance stacks. And based on that, you can have a policy to issue a particular identity to this agent. And same for the workload, but at a more granular fashion. When a workload connects, the agent that's running on the node, <clears throat> when the workload connects to the gRPC API that the agent exposes, on a Unix domain socket, what happens is that um, the agent could introspect this, this, this workload and it can actually consult the kernel to determine a lot of things about this workload, such as um, what is the Unix user ID that this workload's running under, or what container ID it is running under, or what is the image that this container ID is using. Uh, so, in that sense, you can define very rich and granular policies for distributing these identities. And this, these identities really come in the form of um, X509 
ESVINs, and these are the actual TLS certificates. So these are non-CA and leaf certificates, and they must contain exactly one URI subject alternative name, which is essentially the uh, which is essentially the the SPIFI identity, and the SPIFI identity. If you read the standard, there's a bunch of detail around how these identities need to be structured and how they actually differ from URIs. So you can't really have query parameters or uh, port numbers and all that because these things don't make sense in this particular uh, scenario. But it really is in the form of a, the spiffy prefix and then the trust domain and then the actual location of the workload. So it could be data center one slash databases slash uh, instance A, for example. So this is good, right? Now, you have a framework that can allow you to actually obtain an identity in a secure fashion on devices that are not part of the mesh, and you don't need service account tokens. So how is all of that at the moment integrated with Linkerd in order to have this feature that's called mesh expansion? Well. First of all, you have your Kubernetes cluster. And you want to mesh an external workload. You want to make it part of the mesh. Now, oftentimes, if you're running in production, you would have an upstream CA, such as uh, Vault or the likes, or AWS Secrets, that contains and stores your trust routes, so the root certificate uh, with its Key. So this will probably be integrated with, uh, if you're running Clinkerd, with something like a cert manager that would be responsible for periodically issuing, um, <clears throat> periodically issuing certificates, intermediate certificates, that the control plane uses in order to sign end certificates for the proxy. So then you will have your pods running in the cluster and the proxies, and they will get these certificates periodically. But now you also want to mention an external workload. Well, say you have a VM with a bunch of applications that are running there. Now, there's the proxy that is on the VM, and traffic is going to get routed through this proxy, but it needs an identity. So essentially what needs to happen is that you need to have a Spire server hosted somewhere that is also integrated with your upstream CA so it can issue certificates that are um, essentially rooted in the same trust route as the certificates that the proxies get. And then the Spire agent will be running on this particular node that, that these applications and the proxy are running, and the proxy will contact the Spire agent over the Unix domain socket using the gRPC API, the Spire agent will know that this proxy runs under either on a particular AWS instance or an Azure instance or as a particular um, user account ID, and it will give it the corresponding uh, identity. So because now this is... Uh, the proxy gets an identity that's rooted in the same trust domain, like it can mesh with proxies on the cluster. So, and, and it can just like, TLS can be terminated, so you get the identity, you get encryption, you get all of the security features, and you can apply traffic policies, and you know exactly the identity of this proxy that that's, uh, is living over there on this VM. So this is, uh, pretty cool, but uh, there is still quite a bit of work that needs to happen, and we have some future plans for extending all of that. And namely, we're thinking uh, some of the things that we have considered are unifying the identity models between Linkerd and Spiffy Spire, so really kind of maybe use or have a mode where Spiffy IDs are used only uh, not only for external workloads, but for proxies that are... Um, that are outside, uh, that are in Kubernetes as well. Or um, allow Kubernetes proxies to actually obtain their certificates from Spire and not rely on the control plane at all. 
And these things are perfectly possible, like, you know, um, it's just a matter of changes uh, that we need to get through, but they are not particularly challenging. We also need to work on private network support, so um, when there is no connectivity between two networks, so that's on the networking rather than the identity side. And also we are thinking about also DNS proxying, which will open quite a lot of doors for optimizations uh, that, we can, that we can do. So in summary, I would say that um, mesh, ex mesh expansion has multiple applications across a wide variety of industries, and it's something that uh, we are going to see more and more need uh, of, especially with like all the migration to the clouds, the, the, the integration of existing workloads and the likes. Um, however, securing workloads is uh, actually uh, quite challenging, especially when you, when you have completely different constructs compared to what you have in Kubernetes. And that's why we used Spire and Spiffy in order to leverage all of that and, uh, and actually achieve this, the same things that we achieved in the cluster work outside of the cluster as well. And now there is some time for Q&A, I think. Yeah. Thank you. So I think there's microphones that you can use if you want to ask questions, or I can just repeat the question. So um, what I'm a bit unsure about is this request this BioServer receive um, to say, hey, give me a, a certificate that is signed. How does it know that this is not a random request from an untrusted source? I don't. I think I got a bit lost there. Are you talking about uh, in the world of Spire and Spiffy or in Kubernetes? In, in the picture you had before, where the external workload uh, had an agent that called to the Spire server. Yeah. So I didn't really get why the, the Spire server trusts this agent and give it a, a certificate. Because the Spire server supposedly has a mechanism to actually introspect that. Like that's kind of the implementation details of Spire and Spiffy. So essentially, it 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 has its own attestation implementation details that integrate with the particular cloud provider. So it would use like the APIs of the specific vendors to verify that. Oh, so so it's an um, external mechanism that's like a trusted party that provides the info. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So they, yeah, essentially they, they use the underlying infrastructure as a trusted, uh, as a source of trust, right? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yep. Hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, so most of the talk, or uh, when you usually talk about mesh expansion, you're talking about expanding the mesh to um, between the cluster and say a VM. Yeah. But if we have, say, VM A that talks a bit to the cluster and also to VM B, so will the mesh expansion work also between the two VMs uh, completely outside of the cluster? Um, yeah, absolutely. So that's a matter on, of discovery rather than identity, but it should, there is no reason for it to work. So for example, um, you could have two VMs represented as services in Kubernetes, because that's what ends up happening, right? Like each VM is a service in Kubernetes that could be addressed from services outside of Kubernetes. And it can also address services in Kubernetes. So if you have two VMs that have corresponding services, VM A can just uh, target the service that corresponds to VM B that's on the cluster and essentially use that as a discovery mechanism, and the traffic will flow through these two VMs without even actually going to the cluster. So yeah, that's, that's actually, now I understand what you're asking, and that is possible. We've verified that this works. Yeah. Nice, thanks. Hey, thanks for the talk. Yeah. Um, so the last example used like an AWS VM and it used the, the AWS VM ID to right. allow it to issue a certificate. So how would that look for, I, I think you used an, an example of a smartwatch before, like how would, how would that work there? Would you have to like preload the smartwatch with a certain 
certificates or how, how would you allow to issue Aspire certificates? Uh, no, I don't think you need to preload it. Again, like I am, uh, I'm a developer. I'm not an operator. Like I don't really provision, you know, smartwatches with software. But uh, I, I, they are, as I said, this was just an example of a certain way to use the metadata attributed with the workload to attest your identity. But if you look at the Spire implementation, there are a number of plugins that you could use. So I would not be surprised if there are plugins that tie specifically to things like, um, and I, again, I'm, don't quote me on that, but I could imagine plugins being written where you have um, your identity being dependent on, say, a serial number of a particular device and the agent being able to actually read that data via plugin. So then you, you, you end up with a different, different kind of uh, metadata. Right? So each device somewhere will have some metadata. And if that's obtained securely by a trusted party like Spire, then that's fine to use, right? And this metadata could range from instance IDs all the way through serial numbers on, on, on you know, um, on just physical devices. Makes sense. Yeah. Thanks a lot. All right. Well, thank you a lot uh, for listening in on this talk and have a good couple of days.